Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here, pleasure to present before you and uh, give me an excuse to come back to my, uh, my hometown after a number of years of being away. Um, I've been fascinated over the last couple of hours actually to listen to um, the previous speakers and to listen to some of your questions because um, in, in some theoretical senses, in some practical senses, it is exactly where the old Irish Cricket Union, now Cricket Island, used to be and we've gone through some of the pain barriers which some of you have been through or perhaps are currently experiencing so I hope something here would help sort of elucidate and maybe even help you um, to sort of sort of struggle through your own particular journeys. Um, subject to governance perhaps not the sexiest of topics um, but I would argue essential you wouldn't necessarily sit there in the pub looking at a, a Lionel Messi wonder goal or a Dan Carter drop goal or a or a Kevin Peterson 6 and think, wow, I bet they've got great governance. What you probably think, however, is that for the absence of it, I can guarantee you there would be problems. It's probably a little bit like a good football referee, which is when it works or when he or she works, you don't see it. When it doesn't, I can guarantee you, you do notice all the mistakes. Um, what I'm about to show you is very much Cricket Island's own journey. I suspect it would be wrong to say this is the template, it's merely the experience and the journey that we as Cricket Island have been on. And it's still, I think in that sense, journey is the appropriate word because I think it's very much a work in progress. We are a work in progress. In fact, I think if being better and staying ahead of your rivals is your goal, then basically it's a journey, good governance is a journey without a destination. So with all of that introduction, let me start with a good old cricketing cliche which is on the next slide, which is the batting order. Um, I'll go through a little bit of our background, how we got to where we are, the process of change that we as an organisation went through, the current structure that we have, and I'll sort of pull together a few bits and pieces at the end. But I'm glad Tim is no longer here because I'm going to put up something about good governance that um, I d dug around and found. It says, the system by which companies are directed and controlled... Tim talked about openness, accountability, talked about ethical standards. Um, however, the word I'm going to focus on, I'm not going to go into some of the theoretical issues that he covered. I'm going to talk about, for us, the key word there, actually, for sport, I feel, is companies. Because that is how Cricket Island regards itself. It is a company, it's a business. Um, our product is cricket. And our shop window is the senior team, the men's squad on the world stage. At a World Cup whatever form of the World Cup it is. We think that mindset encourages professionalism in what we do. Um, of course, it's one thing to think it, it's probably another to actually encourage it and make it happen. Uh, the title of the presentation was what have been or was good governance, the returns on good governance. So what have those returns been over the last five or six years? We think the process that we've been through has helped us to become successful. Um, and we think the statistics bear it out. Um, just to pick up a couple there. Um, number of staff that we have. Um, three people, we now have 16 people. It says uh, we have 16 in terms of staff, we have other five consultants, 21 on the payroll. Our executive committee, um, Jeff talked earlier, a little bit earlier on about whether it's your board or your committee. We used to have an executive committee of 18 people. We now have a board of 11 people. We had no players who were contracted to the central body, which meant that we didn't control their time. We now have 13 players who are contracted to us whose time the national coach owns, which is crucial in terms of preparing the squad to the best of his ability. Turnover. Um, has increased more than tenfold over that period. Website traffic is a, is a terrific example. The interest in Irish cricket, or Cricket Islands it's now called, is very, very low back in 2005 and six. Team was relatively unsuccessful, weren't really going anywhere. The annual website figures, pretty much the traffic figures, bore that out. Fewer than a million hits on the website. As of the end of the first eight months of this year, we're already at 9.2 million. The interest has just exploded. Um, that's off the pitch. What about on the pitch? What has the island squad, men's squad, achieved? Well, 
for a country where cricket really wouldn't be a men's scene, it wouldn't be a senior sport with a 10th ranked team in the world. Um, we've achieved or reached the second round of two World Cups, which is something that even the test countries haven't achieved. And most of the test countries, or certainly Bangladesh and Zimbabwe, would be regarded as test countries, didn't achieve in that time. Our under 19s are the 10th in the world. Our women are ninth in the world. All this where we are effectively a minnow in our country, in the sport itself. So that's the now. How did we get to where we are today? What was the starting point? Well, between 2003 and 2006, the old Irish Cricket Union, as it was, effectively said, right, we're going to have our first CEO. Let's see what all this professional administration is all about. And they brought on board the first CEO. Our funding model was very much dominated by public handouts, government, and our international federation, the ICC. And we had very limited playing success. I think it's fair to say that the first, first chap probably didn't get the the easiest crack at the whip. He was there for three years. His contract wasn't renewed. Um, I think if you were to ask those who didn't renew his contract, they, didn't, they were saying that he probably wasn't as effective as they would hoped he would have been. I think if you were to ask him, he would probably say, well, I didn't really get the reins from the volunteers. They wouldn't let me be a CEO. What did he, what did he do as a CEO? Well, he booked the flights. He organized the clothing. He effectively acted as an administrator. He wasn't really a chief executive. So he left. Irish cricket went through some soul searching. Shall we have another chief executive? Is it just a waste of an awful lot of valuable resource in the organisation which could go towards maybe two or three development officers or to some proper development programmes or maybe even a couple of contracted players? So what did the powers that be do? Well the chairman said, I tell you what we'll do, we're going to go and ask our public funding bodies. We'll go and speak to our Irish Sports Council and Sport Northern Ireland. And they said, lads, we're thinking about not having a chief executive. What do you think? They said, well, listen, you're entirely free to do what you like. It's a great idea, but you can certainly not count on getting any money from us for the period of time in which you don't have a chief executive. OK, thanks. So <laughs> next was they went to the International Cricket Council, the other major funding body, and said, listen, we're thinking about not having a chief executive. What do you think? They said, great idea, but you can count on getting precisely no money from us over the next three to four years. So by this point, I believe the penny had dropped. And they said, OK, well, it's quite important that we have a chief executive. Therefore, that was myself. I therefore came into a relatively, should we say, open and accepting point that the chief executive doesn't just need to exist, but also that, by the way, if you're going to have a chief executive, make sure that he has some teeth. Make sure that actually he's a guy who isn't just going to be organising clothing and organising flights to get the team from A to B, but he's actually going to have some genuine executive responsibility. So that was taken on board. I came into that environment, which is a very fortunate perspective. Around about this time, I came on board December 2006, approximately six to eight weeks later, um, Ireland participated in its very first Cricket World Cup in the Caribbean. Um, on St. Patrick's Day 2007, Ireland defeated Pakistan um, on that famous match, or famous match certainly within Ireland. They say that um, in the GAA clubs, the Gaelic Games clubs up and down the country, which if you could look at political, historical, cultural um, polls, they would be over there, cricket would be over there. It would be regarded as the sport of the invader, the garrison sport. Apparently the, the women couldn't start the Cayleys on Paddy's night in 2007 because all the men were in the bar watching the cricket. Which was, uh, we realised at that time it was going to be a big opportunity for the sport to suddenly become a little bit more democratic. It put Irish cricket on the map at home and internationally within the cricket fraternity. So we asked ourselves one basic question, well how can we capitalise on the success and move forward? As it happened, we were already talking to a strategic consultancy who was offering us some advice about how we could actually access public funding from Europe or from the Irish government. Um, I simply said to them, well, one question, how can we be better? We have achieved this effectively through the collision of a talented coach, wonderful players, and some guys, some volunteers working hard behind the scenes. How can we make sure that the next time round it doesn't happen by perhaps accident? How can we make sure it happens? And they said, 
you need to start from best principles, best practice principles. The Irish Sports Council, who was obviously delighted about their, at that stage, relatively limited investment in Irish cricket. Tim talked a little bit earlier on about return on investment. We provided, as far as they were concerned, a spectacular return on investment. On the world stage, on Sky Sports, on RTE, the public service broadcaster, an Irish sport that really most Irish hadn't heard of was suddenly beating a team that had won the World Cup in the past. So, they said, you need to look at three key areas. The Irish Sports Council said, we'll pay for it, lads, don't worry about it. It was 15, 20,000 euros. They said, if you're prepared to be better, we will assist you. The strategic agency called ASMT said, you need to look at three areas within your organisation. You need to look at your governance, business administration, and high performance. If you want to put it in another way, who were these? Governance, our board. Business administration, management. High performance, the men's senior squad. And what did, what did they basically imbue? Well, basically, decision making, implementation, and output. They said those are the three key areas of the organisation you need to look at. What was the starting point for that? Well, who did we need to talk to? Whose opinions counted in terms of moving forward the organisation? We embarked upon a significant internal and external consultation. Internally, we spoke to our players, we spoke to our constituent bodies, who were our provincial unions, the four provincial unions, Leinster, Munster, Ulster, Connacht. Um, we spoke to our decision makers, we spoke to our board, our cricket committee, we spoke to, outside of the sport, we spoke to um, the International Cricket Council, we spoke to the England and Wales Cricket Board, our nearest major full member. We spoke to government, we spoke to Irish rugby, we spoke to a broad range of people to say, what does it take to be better? And the key question was, key questions were, where are we at the moment? Do we need to change? In other words, are we already implementing best practice? What is best practice? And we looked to that naturally towards the test countries, to England, our nearest full member nature, very similar to us, I've now gone very Irish, very similar to Irish and Ireland in terms of its legal structures, commercial setups, etc. And then, is it appropriate to Irish cricket? Can we tailor that experience to Irish cricket? Throughout all of the <coughs> reams and reams of trees that were felled to produce all the paper that was distributed to all of the various consultees and all the people that read it, one phrase struck me more than any about the reason that we as an organisation needed to change, why we needed to change. And I'm going to read it out to you, it's quite, it's quite detailed, and I'll, I'll, I'll in fact not read it out to you because it's quite boring, but the bits that are underlined are key <coughs> to what you're talking about here. A governing body is many regulatory, commercial, fiduciary, legal and policy obligations compared to previous times. Our governance, ICU, as the Irish Cricket Union as the, then was, needs to be sufficiently robust to deal with those complexities, maximise the opportunities, in other words, make money, raise funds. However, at the same time, maintain and strengthen the existing structures and relationships. So what does that last one mean? Well, it basically means, we've heard about volunteers, let's not alienate the people with whom we currently work. Let's not alienate our current stakeholders, because they, they are the ones, effectively, who have helped us to get to where we are, and let's not forget that. It's very important. So for me, whenever I've gone around the world talking about this presentation and the governance experience that we've gone through, effectively those, that particular phrase has explained and illustrated the single reason why we as an organisation felt we needed to change. we go through a little bit of what, how, who, etc. What were the key arguments? The, the what? Well, it's best practice. Um, for our constituent unions that limited their financial liability. We're now a company limited by guarantee. We no longer have a constitution. We have a memorandum and articles association. We guaranteed expertise on the board with the changes that we were intending to make, which I shall come to a little bit later on. It also guaranteed us support from our key funding partners, again, which I'll come to later on. 
it withstands external scrutiny. When people look at Cricket Island and they say, well, what's your board like? We can say, well, this is our board. We believe we've gone through a process that has examined best practice and we feel that we can stand over what we do and we feel that we now have the outputs to prove that what we implemented has actually had some teeth. Timing-wise, it was perfect. We've just gone through to the... We've just succeeded at the World Cup and we were asking ourselves a question, how can we be better to make sure that we do particularly well at the next World Cup? And um, for those of you with hopefully not too short memories, the next World Cup was where Ireland beat England in Bangalore on March the 2nd, so arguably I feel that we succeeded that. <laughs> how was it done? Well, it was important to stress that we were making the arguments that we're not saying to you guys, listen, thanks very much indeed, you did really well, off you go. No, what we were saying was that we think you've done a fantastic job to get the organisation to where it currently needs to be. However, there are some now significant challenges and changes and complications to the organisation that we feel we need to supplement. We need to keep the kernel of what you have, but we need to supplement your skills and experience with additional skills and experience to ensure that we can be as robust as we need to be. We had an executive committee of 18. We said the current group was instrumental in getting us there. They were critical in laying the foundations for that support. But fundamentally, how do you get the turkeys to vote for Christmas? The phrase that we heard a little bit earlier on. Well, I was very lucky. We, as the organisation, were very lucky because we were preaching to the converted. The group there understood that they had taken it. They felt as far as they possibly could. They felt that they needed to supplement their skills and experience with additional skills and experience in specific areas. Also, there was a bit of an element of cowardice about it because we did get the consultant to deliver. And when you have a consultant and an independent expert standing in the room saying, well, I tell you what, I've worked with XYZ, ABC, and I can guarantee you this works, that helps. Of course, the fact that we had had it paid for by the Irish Sports Council was also terrific, but all the elements seemed to work. So, who made it happen? Well, there was myself. I was fresh, I was new, and I was only there for about four or five months. I, was, I had no axe to grind. I wasn't aligned politically with a small p to any one provincial union. And when you're when in Ireland and you're talking about the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, it's also correct to talk about politics with a big P as well. There were key volunteers whose assistance I sought and who it was important was seen to be pushing it through, that it wasn't just the new guy who was pushing it through without any experience of the reality on the ground. No, the process was owned by the chairman, by the head of finance and by the then honorary secretary. And they saw it and um, they argued that this is their legacy to leave to Irish cricket. They could put this in place. They were then, um, as it happened, they were all about to finish their, their terms of office. They saw this as a perfect way for them to improve, leave the organisation in a better, wa better way than the organisation they found. We had an independent consultant, paid for externally, but who had great experience. They were the ones who sold it into us. They were the ones who had no axe to grind, who came in and said, we believe this is the way you need to do it. The fact that we had external funding for the process, we had government funding for the process, what was that effectively saying? Well, I tell you what, guys, we're going to give you 20,000. We want you to implement these. We want you to go ahead seek out what is best practice. How would it have been perceived if we had then said, well, that's best practice, actually, no, we're not really interested, we're going to keep it going just the way we are. The government would never have bought that. In fact, they said to us, if you go ahead and implement this, we will support you. It wasn't just the Irish Sports Council, the Republic of Ireland, it was also from Sport Northern Ireland. They said to us, you implement this, we will back you. Also, possibly... We had a new sponsor who was in the offing, our um, current team sponsor, Royal and Sun Alliance. We were talking to them at the time, and they, we said to them, we're considering going through this process. Now, RSA is a major global blue chip organisation. These guys have been implementing and putting in place these sorts of measures for ages. What they didn't want to do was to invest significant sums of money in an organisation they felt was unprofessional. They felt 
wasn't going to be as professional as the principles that they had in terms. They said, if we're going to give you money, we want to see it being spent in the right places, or at least to have the confidence that the decision-making processes about where that money is spent are robust and you can stand over them. How long did all of this take? Well, it felt, I can tell you, remarkably swift. It felt sometimes like we were rushing. There was no real, there was no real deadline date except we were quite keen as it became clear, well listen, we've got our AGM in March 2008, can we get this done in 11, 12 months? And there was a lot that we had to do in that time. Consultation takes a long time. Working out the process about the questions to ask, who you're going to be asked, because I can tell you, everybody feels they need to be involved in a consultation. Whoever isn't involved in a consultation will suddenly, somehow, funnily enough, not quite agree with the conclusions you find. Um, drafting all the papers, decision making, debating, drafting a memorandum of articles, all these things take time. We went through um, the approval process, we went through identifying a nominations committee to find out who should be our independent directors, and I'll come to the independent directors in a second. And we had, in February 2008, the very last AGM of the Irish Cricket Union, and then we had the EGM of the Irish Cricket Union Limited, trading as Cricket Ireland. And uh, that following month, we had the very first meeting of the new company board, from 18 down to 11. So what do we now look like? Well, the board is 11 people. I was delighted to see Jeff's presentation. He said um, the average is about 11 people on the board, and you have six meetings a year, which is precisely what Cricket Island has. I don't know whether that makes us um, perfect, the perfect example or, or media, extremely mediocre. But we have an 11-person board. We have a chairman, plus we have six from our cricketing constituency. And the cricket constituency basically is... The 18 has now become 6. So what was the completely representative model is now 6 people. And those 6 people are, are, um, are complemented by 4 independents. In other words, we have the local knowledge being supplemented by the external expertise. Currently, the majority of the people are the local knowledge. So those who have experience of leading and managing cricket, which are the skills and experience I'll go into in a little bit more detail. So experience of leading and managing the sport. Whether or not we get to a situation in years to come whereby the independent voices will outweigh the regional voices or the sporting voices, I don't know. And I think the jury is out on both of those, whether one is better than the other. For the moment, I think this works for us. The chairman... He has to have at least three years in the last ten leading and managing cricket, probably one of the presidents of the chairman of the previous union, although we've already broken our rule because um, our next chairman, who's going to come in in April 2012, will actually be one of our independent directors. The cricket nominees, however, we said they couldn't just be anyone from the provincial unions. We said no. We felt it was important that they imbued one mandatory or one mandatory or desirable characteristic. Have we been successful in that? Probably not. But the fact is we are requesting it. We're requ not requiring it, we're requesting it. And we're asking each member of the board, when they walk in there, wherever they're from, to say, actually, you aren't here wearing your, your representative hat. You are here as a director of Cricket Island with a fiduciary responsibility to act in the best interests of the organisation. So the composition is skills-based. But it also reflects the geographical diversity of the sport, which is how we pretty much got around making sure that we had somebody from all of the organ all of the parts of the island, which actually, if you think about it, is quite important. There's no point having 10 out of 11 people from Dublin or from Belfast. It's important that you have some form of geographical representation. And as I said, everybody sitting in that room is acting in the best interests of the company. So... In terms of the skills that we as Cricket Ireland felt are important to have as mandatory requirements on the board, well, you can see them all there. We feel that we'll probably over a period of time change some of them. So, for example, desirable requirements, legal experience. 
company and or sporting. I think the experience of the last four or five years of Cricket Islands has probably shown us that actually legal experience is mandatory. Why? Well, probably one, it's best practice. Number two, we don't have a company lawyer. We can't afford a company lawyer. We can't afford an in-house lawyer. We're just dipping our toes now, however, into retaining a legal, um, or obtaining a, um, a law firm on a, on a monthly retainer to provide us with advice, etc. But still, what we need is a legal board on the board to assist us in engaging with that law firm. So basically, we've got people who are talking the same language. But by and large, we feel that those mandatory requirements are essential. And our four independent directors now pretty much have skills in law, finance, marketing, and international cricket. Someone who's either played, uh, played international cricket or has been an umpire at international level or a coach. Those are the skills that we feel are uh, important skills to supplement the local knowledge. So, that is the board, but at the end of the day, the board can't exist as a standalone entity, unless, of course, the model that you have is where you don't have professional staff. I'll be talking specifically where we do have professional staff. So, therefore, the board can't make decisions in isolation, because those decisions are useless unless there is implementation. And that's where engagement between board and management is absolutely essential. When I first came in, the chairman said to me, Warren... I'm the chairman, I don't run the business. You run the business, but I want you to keep me abreast of everything which is happening in the organisation that you think is necessary from a strategic policy perspective. And is there a written book that says what is and what isn't? No, not really. It probably comes through experience, but it also probably comes through, well, what are the major issues that come before the board? And what are the areas that you feel you've placed as skills on the board? So if there's a major legal issue, it probably makes sense and I'm going to bring it before the chairman. He said, I'm not just there to assist you and to, to make policy decisions, but I'm also there to provide me and the board to provide advice, guidance and support. So how does it work at board meetings? Myself and senior management will make recommendations on whatever issues are, are coming before the board. We will write papers, we'll provide the background, we'll have a summary of the issues and we'll make a recommendation. The chief executive or the senior management person will then sit at the board meeting in front of the directors and will make arguments about why he feels or she feels the issues that have been raised should be voted on in a particular way. The board then makes its decision. It's as simple as that. It is two-way communication. It isn't just the members of the board bringing their views and senior management bringing their views to the board and having discussions. The communication must go back the other way as well. So if there's the chairman of Leinster Cricket is there with a particular view, he must ensure that if there's a corporate decision, that that view is then communicated back to his constituents. That is absolutely essential. Regular communication, but there is regular communication between myself, um, the board and senior management, and the subcommittee chairs, particularly of cricket and finance. We believe those are the two most important subcommittees, cricket and finance. We have our other subcommittees to finance, which would be the Audit Committee and the Remunerations Committee as well. There are the other subcommittees to cricket, which would be our Women's Committee, our Disciplinary Committee, etc., etc. And I've mentioned already what the um, independent directors do. Um, has it worked? Well, yes, we would argue that it does. So I went through some of the statistics at the very start about how we can probably measure how well we have achieved over the last few years. It's inherently good. We find that smaller numbers at the board creates more focused discussions. There's less woolly thinking. The external expertise has been valuable. It has actually raised the level of debate. You find that if you've got a chap there who's been a, the chief executive of a, of a major pharmaceutical business for the last 25 to 30 years, he understands the importance of management. He's also got some pretty rich mates, which uh, certainly helps. <laughs> management, the chief executive and senior management and the members of the organisation, the staff feel empowered. We feel like we're making decisions which have been engaged with at the highest level of the sport, and we're now told, right, go ahead and implement. 
It also creates the environment for on-field performance. So it's going to draw a line between a decision that's made in the Cricket Island boardroom and the team winning on the pitch. How has that been the case? Well, when we first made our governance change in 2008, what did we do? We said, OK, we have seen the massive spike in interest in the sport that has come as a result of the profile that has been achieved by winning on the world stage against the team that won the World Cup back in 1992. The board said, let us put the team, the men's senior squad, at the centre of everything that we do. We can't do everything. We're a small organisation. We have to focus on what we're good at. We already know we're good at the men's senior squad, so let's focus on that as the absolute kernel of our organisation for the next four years. Because what should happen? Well, if we do that, success should attract them. If we do that, then we should hopefully achieve success. Success attracts profile. Profile attracts revenue. Revenue means resource. And what resource am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about a strength and conditioning coach. I'm talking about being able to afford more matches against the best teams in the world. I'm talking about video analysis. I'm talking about a fielding coach. I'm talking about all the, what coaches would refer to as one percenters. All the things that make the difference between you and your closest rivals on the pitch. So we have made decisions which have placed the team, the entire strategic direction was geared towards making the team as good as it could be at the 2011 World Cup. Making sure that having beaten Pakistan in 2007, the next time we faced our biggest rivals on the pitch, England, we had the chance of winning, which is precisely what we did. So it's inherently good. It leads to strong results. It also looks good. The perception is the reality, and that is simply the way that it works. Because if you're written about and people are saying you're good, the perception really, really helps. It inspires stakeholder confidence. The ICC hold us up as a model of good governance. The Irish Sports Council, Sport Northern Ireland, hold us up as a model of good governance. Our players have confidence in what we do. I can tell you, in 2007, one of the legacies of the hangover of the past was that we had, although we performed well at the World Cup, our finances were shocking. We were awful. We had one person who held all the purse strings, didn't communicate with anybody else. It was a disaster. We were organising a major event against India and South Africa in 2007. Um, we poured all of our money into that. Oh, we forgot to pay the players for their bonuses from the World Cup. I can tell you that didn't go down too well. It was a disaster. So having gone through the process of saying, well, I tell you what, we want to be better. The players are aware that we wanted to be better. We've gone through the process of wanting to be better. They were involved in the consultation of wanting to be better. They now look at us and have confidence in us. We pay them on time. We make sure that they are turn up in the right kit. All their flights go in the same direction. We have the teams going all on. <laughs> Trust me, you may laugh. <laughs> all of the players go on the same plane. All these things, we, the very first person I brought on board was a team's administrator to make sure the team was looked after. Our committees have confidence in, confidence in us. The media talks nicely about us. Us, we have employees who want to be part of a successful organisation. Public funders. I can draw a direct line between good governance and getting simply more cash, which is that Sport Northern Ireland um, would be responsible for probably about 10 to 15 percent of, um, of our annual revenue. They have now determined that they are only going to fund governing bodies based on those who have good governance models. So we have a 18-page checklist of about 95 different boxes that we need to tick which are all based on good governance. How far in advance do your um, papers go out to your board? How soon after are the minutes circulated? How soon, uh, how, how are your child protection? How, you know, who looks after your child protection? What about anti-corruption processes? Everything that you can think of that Tim, Timothy Dutton talked about earlier on are the principles of good governance. Sport and all said, we will fund you based on those principles. They have four levels of what they call assurance. Nil, reasonable, sorry, nil, limited, satisfactory, and substantial. Cricket Island was nil 18 months ago. We're now substantial. What does that mean? Well, it means that whereas previously we only got 10% of our funding in advance and had to produce all sorts of receipts for the 
final 90%. We now receive 90% of our funding in advance and only have to produce receipts for the last 10%. Because of the constrained public funding purse, in, not just in Ireland, but obviously not just in the UK, obviously, but in Ireland as well, they're looking to find excuses to fund a smaller number of sports, or they're looking for excuses to take money away from particular sports and give it to those who potentially deserve it more. Cricket would be seen as a more deserving case because of the process that it's gone through, leading to the results that it has on the pitch, because what they want is return on investment. So what they're doing is the money that other, other sports aren't receiving because they're not ticking the boxes, cricket is benefiting from. And I mentioned about RSA as well, their perception. They said, well, if you guys are going to be putting the money into the right places, making the right decisions, organising yourselves professionally, we're prepared to put money towards you as well. OK. The virtuous circle, let's call it. This is the experience that Cricket Island has had. We've reformed our governance, which led to a unified perspective from the board, everybody pointing in the same direction. The board saying, what is going to give us the best chance of success on the pitch and off the pitch? It's the men's senior squad. So let us put the team at the centre of policy. Therefore, because of success, resource flows to the team. The team becomes successful. Profile, revenue, numerous resources of the team, therefore more success. The virtuous circle, can we guarantee that it's going to keep happening like that? No, but we believe if we keep doing the right things, if we keep questioning ourselves. I think, um, Jeff, you mentioned a little bit earlier on, do you as an organisation continue to question ourselves? We do. Uh, we went through a, a board um, evaluation process back in March. Very first time, probably three years is a little bit too long. We should have done it earlier. We didn't. Um, but it was fascinating. We were asking ourselves what we think are the right questions, which was, do we have the right issues coming before the board? Do we meet frequently enough? Is the level of debate high enough? Are we getting the right level of input from the members of the board? Is the chairman good enough? All these questions, and we implemented the various bits and pieces that came out from it, we're implementing them now. So, conclusion is, from our perspective, Change isn't just worth it. We found it's absolutely essential for us to move forward. It isn't rocket science, but it does take time and it takes effort and it requires buy-in. It has certainly improved the organisation inherently and it's improved our perception of us. It has attracted more money, both from the public and the private purses, and it has made our team improve. I'm absolutely convinced about that. And certainly, it's, God loves a trier. It's demonstrated the desire to improve. Thanks very much.